very valuable lessons uh, about life in general. You know, nobody's better than you, but you're no better than anybody else. You've got to work hard, and I did. I was able to mow people's grasses, I, their yards. I painted houses. Goodness, I worked at a local funeral home. And uh, during college days, I actually was able to work in the coal mines uh, for two summers. So when my mother died, the little community just wrapped its arms around me. The Rotary Club gave me a scholarship. Westmoreland Coal Company gave me a scholarship. And uh, I got work study and several other type of scholarships back then. So I was able to go to WVU and then Marshall Med School and then Wake Forest for my residency. And uh, and uh, basically have been back in my hometown for 34 plus years, uh, West Virginia through and through, if you would. Love it. I've always wanted to give back to it and uh, its people and embrace its uh, love of the land and uh, just the people are so strong and uh, just again if i'd like to meet a person that's more west virginia than me so what impresses you actually the most about the people of west virginia well they're you know again they're very resilient uh, caring care about the family the family unit's very important the land is very important People are always willing and ready to pitch in to help a neighbor. That's one of the issues we had. I mean, people, we're a, we're a huggy, shake hand feeling uh, type people. And with this uh, coronavirus uh, pandemic, it's, uh, we really had to work hard on that. It does show this pandemic, though, the character of West Virginia. And I again want to thank all the essential employees, the frontline workers, uh, including the grocery shelves. Uh, Delivering food, the health care providers, the first responders, the nurses, teachers, and school bus drivers and volunteers who are trying to bring the food out so kids can have food to eat. And it's great to see we're doing what West Virginians do best, that we rally together, do what's necessary during tough times. Now, how is your family coping with COVID-19? Well, I have a daughter and grandson, and they live in Lexington, Kentucky. And they have all but been, you know, in the house, quarantined, school's out. Uh, and so that's, uh, you know, I tried to get them to come up here and hang out. Uh, I think they were concerned about the fact that I'm a physician. They didn't want to necessarily uh, be around someone like me, even though I have definitely socially distanced myself. But, uh, but this impacts everyone's life, and we're all frightened for good reasons. Uh, we're concerned, and I think one of the main reasons we really woke up and started distancing physically was when we found out that our health care providers did not have adequate personal protective equipment. And I think that's really a, one of the two big failings in this whole pandemic, the other being lack of testing. So, you know, again, we're all, you know, we're all concerned about our small businesses and individuals who've lost their jobs. And we just have to, uh, you know, again, hope that the, the response, the, the push out of federal dollars and things like that would, uh, would help us all land on our feet. As a physician, I'm on the front lines also uh, trying to educate not only my patients, but the entire state. And again, it's uh, my message was uh, act as if everyone has the coronavirus and that will make you you know think twice about getting in someone's face or anything like that so and i deal with the stress by simply hiking in the woods near me or working in the yard i've been able to enjoy that in fact i was up to the top of the hill today uh that's a little brisk but uh you know I, I think that's how families are getting through it and that's how my family is that's a very good rule of thumb uh, that you brought up about uh, if you act like everything or everyone uh, like has coronavirus, um, you end up taking you know better precautions and you uh, are much more careful for sure. Indeed, and that was a message I started to get out you know a good long while ago. Uh, and back in the you know, when we were still in session, I knew this was coming, and I spoke with several of my public health colleagues. And uh, really focused on how we could educate our populace and 
let them be ready to uh, deal with this uh, through social distancing. And again, that's our only real treatment. We can't treat it and we can't prevent it except through distancing. So uh, I was able to uh, get an amendment uh, and a bill through the legislature the last week that would put $2 million into the con- governor's contingency fund, into the um, public health emergency fund that would uh, help the DHHR and the Bureau of Public Health to get more information out to doctors, hospitals, and the general population so that we could prepare for this. Now, what do you think about Governor Justice's COVID response? Well, I mean, again, I I think the two main issues, I'm not sure he could have done much about it, and that is the lack of testing and the lack of personal protective equipment. I think early on we were more reactionary than proactive. And, uh, Again, I, I think he does now have a, a good team around him. He's Dr. Clay Marsh, Dr. Kathy Slim, Bill Crouch, General Hoyer. I think, if anything, the, the lack there is, is maybe geriatrics, and uh, you know, because I, you know geriatrics are a little bit different, particularly people in the nursing homes, because you know you can unfortunately many of our loved ones in the nursing home are there because of dementia. And so you tell them not to touch their face. Well, they can't remember to not touch their face. And so I think that's one of the, that type behavior that we all can recognize, but many of these patients can't. It's one of the reasons you really, really have to focus on with our seniors, particularly our seniors in uh, local nursing homes. And, uh, you know, over the past several years, just like the federal government did, it cut the CDC funding, and we cut. Uh, I voted against it, but they, you know, in order to balance the budget back in 2016, the legislature and, and the governor cut funding to local health departments and the Bureau of Public Health by a full 25%. And so, given the constraints where they had to let many epidemiologists go, where we're trying to trace these folks, you know, if you have an exposed person, who are their contacts? I think they're doing a heroic job given their limitations that, frankly, we caused because of the inability to uh, raise any uh, revenue and just simply cut uh, public health, which is certainly something I think we've uh, learned a lesson from, you know? Now, what do you also think about the national COVID-19 response? Well, same thing. We, we, you know, when you give tax breaks to people, the money has to come from somewhere. And I guess some of the low-lying fruit, if you would, has always been education and public health. And that's what they did, too. So the, the CDC's budget's been slashed dramatically. The other thing is we shipped so much of our manufacturing overseas, you know, to save a a nickel or a penny or something. And uh, that's come back to bite us really, really badly. So again, with the lack of testing, they're ramping it up. And then, uh, you know, the the lack of personal protective equipment. And then, you know, not having an, an adequate stockpile. Now, again, this is unprecedented. Who would have thought this other than maybe Bill Gates I heard he mentioned this about two or three years ago. But our national response has not been good. And, uh, again, this is all tied together. Um, so. Now, to kind of tie in more into West Virginia and uh, to get off of COVID, uh, this also ties into a Miss Reed uh, asked this question on Facebook which is, what are your ideas on how we fight the opioid crisis? And her idea, or her question was, how do we address the substance abuse crisis? Well, that's something I've been trying to do for <clears throat> years, if not decades. So, you know, we were a part of that 1980s where we uh, were told that opioids are not very addictive. We need to get the pain level down to a certain level. You know, we we do the temperature, pulse, blood pressure, respiration, and then they came up with the fifth vital sign, 
manage your level of pain. And, uh, and there was a lot of marketing in that regard. Uh, we well-trained physician knew that there was some risk of, uh, you know, of addiction, but a lot of folks couldn't take uh, the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs such as naproxen or ibuprofen, meloxicam, diflucan. I mean, not diflucan, but diclofenac uh, and Celebrex. So those those medicines can really hurt your kidneys, impact your clotting mechanism. And then the other medicine was Tylenol. Okay, so, uh, and then the other ones were uh, basically uh, opioids. And so we didn't realize the risk was as high as it was back in those days. So, <clears throat> so patients, uh, you know, got in that cycle of not having a lot of hope. They hurt. They hurt not only physically, but other types of pain. And they would take these pain medicines and they felt better. So we've worked on, you know, trying to restrict the amount of opioids that are prescribed. And, and I've, again, been on the point, point of the arrow on several of these endeavors uh, where we uh, limit initial prescribing to opioid naive patients. So people that's never been taking these medicines, we really limit how, you know, starting them because we know that the risks are a lot higher than we once thought. And then the other thing is allowing for Narcan to be available and, uh, realizing that we really need a full spectrum of recovery regarding, you know, getting people in uh, to some type of stabilization recovery and then long-term recovery and then reintegration into society. So those are all things that, <clears throat> frankly, I've worked on over the years uh, and uh, continue would continue to do so. Uh, but this, you know, there, there's a lot of root causes uh, of these of the not feeling good and, and 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 one of them of course is is the adverse childhood experiences we know that people that have a lot of stress uh, they have more epinephrine in their system and that is not a good thing that causes you know potential heart disease uh stress uh, anxiety the good the good neurotransmitter is dopamine and so People that have a lot of stress in their life, the adverse childhood experiences, uh, they they require a lot of dopamine to feel good. So they, you know, they have to overuse anything that makes them feel good. So that increases the risk for addiction as well. So there's the science of addiction. There's the stigma of addiction that, you know, it is a disease, and uh, we need to treat it as a disease. And so those are all things that. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm well versed in, and, and certainly have worked hard on. Well, actually, now, one of the things one of the things that I saw is this is kind of important is that when we cut off the supply of these medicines, we didn't really have an adequate recovery system or, or, or medication assisted treatment program in place. So when these folks couldn't get their hydrocodone or whatever, then they went to something else, and that something else, unfortunately, was heroin. So as the number of prescribed drugs went down, prescription drugs, the number of overdose deaths went up. And we caused that, to be honest with you, by not having everything in place. So one thing I've learned about government is it's hard to find that fine tuning knob. Now, uh, talking about your experience uh, with everything, uh, you are a physician as well, like we mentioned before. Uh, so first off, what is your specialty? Uh, yeah. And uh, how do you think that this is going to help you with your uh, run for governor? Well, I'm an internal medicine specialist, and uh, I had added qualifications in geriatrics. And so I, you know, tend to treat a sicker, older population. And I, I treat, you know, them, <laughs> and, you know, you, you go in, you take a history, you diagnose the problem, you treat them. And uh, sometimes you have to make them just, you know, they live with the disease. Uh, but I've, I've just enjoyed that immensely. And I kind of take a similar approach uh, when I look at policy issues. You, you look at an issue and you say, well, here's the problem. Let's try to get to the root cause, find out what's really causing this. And then let's try to fix it by whatever means necessary. And so that's... Uh, I think being an internal medicine doctor who relies on taking the history and trying to get to root causes has really helped me as 
far as uh, being a, a policymaker as well. And you see the, you know, you, you see the behaviors, you see the social determinants of health. You know, the health system, if, if there were no doctors, hospitals, pharmacists, drugs, anything like that, 80% of the health outcomes would be the same. What makes health outcomes really has to do with whether you have an education, whether you can make a living, uh, what your behaviors are, uh, things like that. And we've not done well in our healthcare system because we focused on that 20%. We focus, you know, our, our system is a fee for service system. And so over the next several years, there's going to be dramatic change in healthcare and how it's delivered and how it's paid for. That's another reason why uh, I decided to step up to the plate because I think it's just so important to be patient-centered and to, and to focus on that patient's ability to get good, high-quality, affordable, accessible health care. And uh, I just think that that, again, distinguishes me from uh, anyone else in the, in the race. So talking about that, um, do you believe in Medicare, Medicare for all, and how do we pay for it? Well, again, Medicare is a federal issue. I think you're going to be seeing all kinds of different models uh, and maybe even pilot programs. Uh, and again, the, the state has to do with Medicaid, you know, it's, Medicaid is a state program that's partially federally funded. But, um, you know, I, I don't know whether we, we're going to have a single-payer system. Uh, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't matter. Uh, but, uh, you know, that's something that will be coming down the pike on a federal issue. And I think that this uh, corona pandemic will maybe uh, accelerate the process as to what our health system is going to look like. But I can tell you that... Uh, Again, with my background, I'll, I'll have a leg up on any any of the uh, you know plans coming down the road. And again, met, you know, if you look at our payer mix, West Virginia has about 1.7 million people. Okay, and 1.1 or 1.2 are insured by some government pay program. There's 400,000 uh, Medicare. Okay, there's about 550 to 600,000 Medicaid and of that group there's about 150 to 160 expanded Medicaid population that we expanded that to include the working poor about four years ago and, uh, and, and again with Medicaid we get a federal match so every dollar that the state of West Virginia spends for a Medicaid patient the federal government gives three dollars that's the traditional now if you're in the expanded population every dollar that we spend the federal government pays nine dollars that's how we can better use our state dollars to draw down these matching federal dollars to improve access to care and to help maybe our hospital situations as well because medicaid's reimbursement's fairly low similar to medic well a little less than medicare and then peia has two hundred thousand West Virginians insured, and they pay less than Medicaid. So, so that's why you know our docs have uh, basically either had to be employed by a hospital or a federally qualified health center, or uh, you know you just don't see private practice docs out there much anymore. I'm not sure if your dad is private practice or not. He but is. It would be rare. He is, it, and we are. It is very, very uh, rare. You really don't see them much anymore. That said, I mean, you know, our extensive community health centers, these federally qualified health centers that get what's called cost-based reimbursement, uh, they are, you know, really good access points for people that either don't have insurance or have this, uh, you know, federal or state-sponsored insurance because they get more money per visit than private docs. And if you've seen anything... Lately, this uh, federal money is going to support these FQHCs, but probably not the private docs. Uh, and then the other thing that's uh, where people can get access to care. And, and if you don't have insurance, they have a sliding scale. Uh, 
But the other thing is these pharmacies, uh, the 340B pharmacy, mm. allow the federal government pays more money, or you don't have to pay as much to buy the medicine, so the pharmacy then can pass on to the patient a much lower cost. Probably not fair, frankly, to uh, the, the regular pharmacies uh, or the private docs, but it, that's that's the system we're in right now. And so a lot of people are taking full advantage of that. Now to talk about a, another very local question, how would you support our uh, coal miners? Well, again, I'm, I'm in Boone County, uh, where forever was the largest coal producing county. So I've been here providing health care to the retirees, uh, the miners, and their children. For, uh, you know, in the end of June will be 35 years. I work in the coal mine, so I know what it's like to be underground, in the water, in the, around the electricity, in 48-inch coal. And so I, I understand that, and it's been a great uh, life lesson for me. Uh, I, these, these are my neighbors. Uh, these are my patients. Uh, and so I, I care for them, and I, and I understand when, you know, when there was a strike back in the old days or whatever, then, you know, we'd try to prop them up and not charge them and give them free medicine until, uh, you know, until they could get back to work. And I know the, you know, the roller coaster ride. So you know you may be doing great for a while, and then the next thing you know, you're you're not you don't even have a job, and so you have to move or try to get retrained into something that you know you're not used to doing. I know a lot of folks have done everything from going to nursing uh, to uh, having to leave out of here. Southern West Virginia has had a, a significant population loss, largely because we weren't diversified. Our, all our eggs were in one basket. All our eggs were in coal down this way. Uh, also, if I might add, uh, you know, the last two or three years, I found out that they've taken the chest X-ray evidence out as a finding for black lung. So I've I've had three bills in the legislature to uh, to help uh, coal miners that have black lung. They clearly have black lung. They have massive fibrosis, but they still can't get a benefit because they can blow into a machine and that's it, really testing for asthma instead of black lung, a restrictive airway disease. And so these, uh, so I've worked on those issues as well. Now, another question that I want to ask, some conservatives are concerned about having Democrats in office, and it also is vice versa. How do you bring us all together and work for all of our interests rather than only our individual interests? Well, again, that's what I've done. If I've done anything, in the past 14 years, I've been the person that uh, brings people together, uh, come to consensus, compromise. And even when, you know, I went from a majority member to a minority leader, I still am able to get bills passed. I, I'm well respected by folks on both sa- sides of the aisle. Uh, I'm, again, that's how you get things done. And that's exactly what I would do as a governor. I would use the governor's office uh, in the mansion as a place where you bring people together, a melting pot of ideas. Uh, you get people, uh, you know, whether it's around a fire or around a table, and you, uh, you find out, uh, you know, what your, what your prize is. What, what are we trying to do here? And then through a bunch of people uh, with uh, a lot of diverse ideas, then you, you come to uh, uh, a solution and, and you get things passed. That's one of the things we've not had in a while. You have to use that governor's office and not as a, you know, polarizing thing where you, you know, throw the Democrats under the bus or something like that. You, you have to just bring people together and respect the fact that the people elected these people. So I've worked very well when the, my fellow senator was uh, uh, Earl Ray Tomlin, I worked well with uh, Senator Art Kirkendall, uh, Sen- you know, Senator Hardesty, Senator Ojeda. So whoever the electorate brings to that capital, then you work with them. That's the voice of the people, and you, and you value them. You absolutely value 
them. And, and I think, I mean, for the most part, I, everybody up there wants to do good for the state of West Virginia and its citizens. Now, to also hit on another uh, local thing that is currently causing a lot of people to go into a uh, storm, what is your opinion on gun rights? Well, I mean, I believe certainly in the Second Amendment and the right to bear arms. Uh, I'm an old country boy, so I've got shotguns, pistols, and rifles. Um, and uh, the NRA over the years has, has been favorable to me. I'm not somebody that wants to come in there and take your guns. Now, I can tell you that with certain organizations like that, I mean, if you even just want a little bit better background check or something, they spin it in such a way that they really make you look terrible. So those are things that, you know, are, are just a, <laughs> it's just politics, if you would. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm certainly a, you know, pro gun right uh, person. Uh, obviously, you know, when you look at all these, you know, high power, I mean, all these uh, automatic uh, weapons and things, it kind of makes you cringe a little bit, but those are criminals, I guess, that have that. So uh, it's a, it's a, something that you work with over the years. Again, I've been up here 14 years and uh, have, uh, pretty good voting record now another question that i have is how do you protect minorities and their interests without making the majority feel left out well i just think that you have to be inclusive of all ideas and interests and to bring people together that's one of the nice things we have in a, in a fairly small state uh, you, can, you can make everyone's voice heard but uh yeah, I mean, we just need to be inclusive. And, and I've lived my life that way. When someone comes into my doctor's office, I treat each and every one the best the best I can. I respect them for whoever they are, and I try to take the best possible care that I can for them. All right, now to my uh, last question for you, and then we are going to head over to our comment section right after we get done with our giveaway. And that is, how do you feel about your competitors, especially like Stephen Smith with the West Virginia Can't Wait and uh, these other, uh, or your other uh, competitors as well? Oh, they're good people. They're, they're nice people. Uh, several years ago, I had Steve and his wife and uh, the Lairds, <laughs> Will and Emily down. I took them on the, the pond fork of the Little Cold River on our, you know, kayaking and I've had Steve up on the Hobet mine project and on a four wheeler. Uh, these guys, they're all good guys. Uh, and, uh, you know, they're, they're, they care. They're, they're young, frankly, and, uh, <laughs> relatively inexperienced, but, uh, they're good people. All right. Well, let's get to our giveaway. So our giveaway today is again it is four buffalo nickels those were sponsored by appalachian um, certified home inspections so thank you guys for that and also we have a box of um, pecan turtles so again there's uh, if you have a nut allergy uh, you got to be careful and some by the looks of it some german chocolate so definitely and the chocolate was donated by Dr. Ali Khan's office. So our giveaway question, and uh, all you have to do, and then right after we get done with our giveaway, we will immediately get to our comment section. So we will answer all those comments there, but I want to get our giveaway out of the way first. So our giveaway question is, who was the doctor that performed the very first heart transplant? It's a uh, very good question. Very, very good question. And again, we will get to your comments right after we get done with the giveaway, so make sure to stay tuned. But again, the question is, who was the doctor that performed the very first heart transplant? This is for both the chocolates 
and the four buffalo nickels. Comment your answers in.
Congratulations, Miss Allison Harrison. You won the four Buffalo Nickels and the two things of chocolates. I don't want to sound creepy, but I know exactly where to drop it off at, so I will be dropping, dropping it off right on that doorstep uh, as soon as we get done here. So congratulations, you won the four, unless you don't want me to drop it off there, or if that place that I might be wanting to drop it off, I might get shot walking up to that doorstep, so let me know beforehand. But otherwise, I will... Uh, immediately as soon as we get done uh drop that stuff off so now let's get to our comment section and our first comment is from miss deegan's i'm going to apologize if i butcher your names but i'm taking this straight from the comment section so should west virginia join a consortium with kentucky ohio and virginia to move us back into the economy in concert like northeastern states are doing yeah, certainly a consideration. Uh, you know, one always worries that they're going to get short uh, changed uh, in a consortium. But, uh, yeah, I mean, we're a region here. I think you could look at this from a regional aspect. Uh, and our, you know, frankly, our economy is probably hurting more than others. Uh, you know, we're, we rank 45th in broadband access. And I think having that broadband infrastructure uh, is going to be really crucial. As we go forward, I think we've really exposed ourselves with regard to trying to teach our kids uh, and, uh, you know, do telemedicine and things like that that requires broadband. So if this could somehow enhance our ability to, uh, you know, grow broadband and other type of infrastructure, then I would be for it. Uh, again, I, it's probably, you know, it's, it would, it, I think it just requires people working together uh, and again, think that would be more of a national issue but uh, certainly I've been involved in interstate cooperation in the past in the Senate and uh, it, it makes some sense yes so our next question is from Miss Reed what is your plan to address the substance abuse crisis well that's just it I do have a plan uh, it's a part of my platform and uh, it'll be on my Stallings for West Virginia Facebook page. Uh, again, it's a substance use disorder and recovery plan. Uh, it's lengthy, frankly, but uh, I would establish the governor's office of substance use disorder and recovery services to coordinate the state efforts to manage uh, this. Uh, we just have to have better coordination. There's going to be a lot of settlement money coming out, and there's going to be a lot of federal money coming out for this very thing, and we absolutely have to take full advantage of that from, uh, you know, looking at it long-term, looking at our education system. And we need to adopt a transformative approach to long-term and community-based treatment and recovery uh, for all substance use disorders, such as the addiction recovery medical home model. Uh, that uh, is an innovative approach that changes the payment model from fee-for-service to a value-based model that focuses on recovery outcomes. It also uh, has elements... Uh, of determining quality metrics, establishing integrated care network, building care teams who focus on a holistic recovery process. So it's just a, a lot of things. We have to maximize the SAMHSA dollars, the substance abuse and mental health services dollars, and the workforce, the HRSA, the Health Resources and Service Administration. Integrate all this stuff into the primary care system uh, because that's, you know, you get rid of the stigma if you don't have to go to the recovery clinic, you know, or the where the addicts go, whatever, you you, you integrate all this stuff into the primary care system, and uh, we'll you know we'll the offer the I'll establish a governor's office of grants and partnership to uh, to not leave any grant money on the table. So, uh, you know, according to the Alliance for Addiction Payment Reform, the various state and local opioid lawsuits are underway, and, and we'll be getting some of that. We just have to use it. And we got to just take, uh, you know, we, we've got a lot of things going on. I think of the things going on in Huntington with PRO Act and, and all that stuff. So we have a lot of things going on, uh, including reintegrate Appalachia. We have to listen to folks on the front line, including our law enforcement also officers, our physicians, nurses, mental health. That's a focus on mental health. 
let's get to the root cause of this stuff. I think people that have jobs and and have a life are less apt to, you know, have to go use, even though it's not, it doesn't give you immunity from it, but it certainly would help in many ways. That'll be uh, on, uh, my platform will be posted here in the next day or so, if it's not already. So next, uh, my father asks, actually, uh, private practice is a, impossible now because federal government and the state is in a competition with private practitioners. How can you win that? How can you win that? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't know that we can. I mean, I talked with uh, all the deans of the three medical schools. Uh, I've been pushing and fighting for private practice for decades. Uh, and, uh, you know, one of the problems, and I'll just share this with you. One of the problems is physicians have always thought that they're above politics. So they're famous for not getting involved in politics. And uh, look where that's got us. They think that it doesn't impact us. I mean, it, Im it impacts what you make financially. It impacts uh, what prescriptions you can write, what tests you can order, all this stuff. And so we've, uh, we've let it get away from us. Uh, and he's right. I mean, there's uh, the private practice model in the fee-for-service uh, system just doesn't work anymore. Uh, and, and he knows this. You know, we used to get in that little rat cage and just work harder, work harder, work harder, make a little less, make a little less. Then if, you, if he remembers, we, uh, we got electronic health records. And when that happened, it slowed us down tremendously. And it increased our overhead tremendously. So the cost of technology was, was one big, you know, gut shot, and then the other one was an uppercut, was, it slowed us down. So in today's society, it doesn't work. Uh, the question is, do you want physicians to care about the patients and make it patient-centered reforms coming down the line for people who, are, who don't? We don't know what's uh, happening in the healthcare system. Our next question is from Allison Harrison. Uh, what about jobs, uh, oil and gas industry, manufacturing, uh, people like my husband and I who had to leave and to find work? How does he propose to stop that? Well, thank you. And again, what we've done historically is we've tried to cut taxes. You know, we've cut the corporate net income tax, the business franchise tax. As it turns out, we're ranked about 17th best in the country from a tax standpoint. Uh, so, again, what, what we need to do, basically, is to invest in infrastructure. Uh, we need to support entrepreneurs and small, small business, ensure access to quality health care. People do, you know, do not want to locate in a place where they can't have their kids educated or have good health care. So we have to expand education programs and opportunities. Uh, one of the things I've tried to do down here in, in coal country was to use our post mine land sites to have shovel ready sites for business. Uh, and uh, even uh, have a tax credit if you locate a business on a post mine land site. If you think about all the big things that are in West Virginia, the FBI Center, Milam Park in Morgantown, Bridgeport. All of those things are located on a post mine land site. And so, uh, but it, we have to absolutely uh, support entrepreneurialism, uh, technology. We, we have the ability to really be a high tech uh, area. Tech Connect in West Virginia is doing great things. We have, you know, we need to make sure our, we have year round tourism industry uh, that supports West Virginia businesses and attracts outsiders. You can't beat West Virginia as a place to, to be. We have to take advantage of our Bechtel Summit Reserve in, in Fayette County, where the world jamboree is. There's going to be people that come here, visit, and want to stay. And how about this? I know people don't want necessarily people with coronavirus coming to West Virginia. But guess what? The, the first place people want to come in a, in a pandemic is West Virginia. We're rural, we have a great outdoor, we have a great outdoor lifestyle. Uh, we have to take advantage of our rich natural resources. And the one thing that I think about are these rare earth elements. 
we, you know, where coal was laid down the same millennia is when uh, these rare earth elements were. So we can't harvest these rare earth elements and send them somewhere else to be manufactured. We absolutely have to make sure that we uh, produce these value-added uh, products here in West Virginia. We have to take advantage of agriculture in our forests. Uh, we would, you know, we would have direct sale of agriculture project product to, you know, farm to table, farm to school, farm to seniors. Um, so, you know, there's I have again a, a fairly robust uh, economic development plan that uh, we'll be able to review here uh, shortly. I appreciate that. Uh, the other thing is we can attract retirees you know people with just a little tweaking of our tax system retirees with uh, real income would love to come to west virginia but i think expanding our broadband capabilities i think is pretty crucial uh, as a as a you know just one thing we really have to do all right our next question is from miss campbell what about funding for rural small community hospitals well, first of all, uh, Denise Campbell is a very smart, caring person, and so I appreciate her asking this question, and uh, very knowledgeable, so she could probably answer this as well as, as I could. But, you know, if you have a critical access hospital, okay, these are, like Boone Memorial Hospital is a critical access hospital. Like many other things, it gets, it gets cost-based reimbursement, uh, so it gets more reimbursement uh, than uh, regular hospitals. We have to really look at what we're paying these hospitals from a Medicaid standpoint. That's something we can change here in, in West Virginia. We only pay about 35 cents on the dollar. Now, if we could use that three to one or nine to one federal match that we talked about a while ago, spend not a whole lot of state dollars, but, but altogether a fair amount of dollars, then we can increase reimbursement rates to these hospitals and keep them open. So I think that's, and, and same with PEIA, we need to better reimburse these hospitals. And, and nationwide, there's about a quarter of the hospitals that are at risk. And this pandemic has really exposed the issues of not being able to do elective procedures, which are really money makers. And then whether or not we can, uh, you know, change our uh, whole payment system, uh, provisional payments and, and uh, things like that, are, are what's coming down the line. And again, if, if you don't get anything from this, uh, I have been involved in this type of health care policy for decades. I mean, I've been involved as uh, council of state governments. It's a national thing. I was chairman of the Health Policy Committee for two years. This, are, this is information that I know about, and we have to, again, continue to be patient-centric and care about our patients and make sure that they have the access to care because if a hospital closes, you lose all those jobs. I mean, it, it's just crippling to a community, obviously. So it's not just health care. It's the economy as well. So our next question is all is uh, from Miss uh, Matheny. Given that the Department of Education says the state has more than ten thousand homeless children and seven thousand foster children, how can we improve educational outcomes? Well, you know, obviously we need to invest in birth to three because these are kids that have uh, a lot of stress in their life. We have to get our arms around the substance use disorder or the opioid epidemic uh, and that is to turn the spigot off and then with these uh, folks that are in the system we have to uh, uh, do trauma-informed treatment it's not like what's wrong with you it's what happened to you and you have to uh, take a different approach uh, to trying to educate our children but we absolutely have to do that or we're going to lose another generation. But we know that these minds are developing rapidly from the time they're born until they're three years old. 
we really have to focus on reading. Uh, because if you can't read by the time you're, you know, in the in kindergarten or, or first grade, then you really are hamstrung for the future because all other learning, for the most part, is uh, through reading. So we have to just focus on reading, uh, realize that kids learn differently. Some people are tactile, some are visual. Uh, but those are things that we have to invest in. And whatever it takes, we have to do it because otherwise these foster kids, when they age out, if, if we're not real careful, and we did some uh, foster care reform this past year so that we have these kids that when they turn 18, they don't just automatically leave the house and they're out there on the street or something, which is what it had been, where 50% of these foster kids were incarcerated. So we now have a transition period, which is great. Uh, and we have to, again, when you look at the, the foster system, we have to uh, invest in our in the grand families and kinship care, which we did. We I fought hard for increased funding, so we went from about $8 million of state money to about $19 million. So uh, the, these are crucial issues, and, and I do have a plan for that. The problem, though, we passed a bill two years ago that would provide wraparound services so for counselors, social workers, and nurses. The problem is we've not valued those workers, and so you don't have a strong workforce right now. So we have to go back all the way into middle school, if you would, and try to get these folks into a career track, and then you have to pay them a living wage. You can't just, you know, get some a college graduate, you know, twenty six thousand uh, dollars, where they're, you know, eligible for food stamps or something. You have to pay them a real salary because they're going to be performing a real service. Our next question is from Mr. Moorhead. If elected, what would be your first order of business in office? I think that depends on where we are. I mean, you know, if we have an extra month in a gubernatorial year. So we just don't know whether this pandemic is going to be uh, uh, something that we're going to still be dealing with. But I can tell you what I would do right off the bat is to surround myself with some really great people from all walks of life all regions of West Virginia, and uh, like I've done in many other uh, hats that I've worn, you'd have strategic planning, and I've got the plan, uh, that, you know, that I've gotten from a lot of different people. You have to focus on education, the economy, and health care, those three big, huge pillars, and, uh, and we have to invest in critical areas such as infrastructure, so the, the budget has to be uh, in such a way that we're investing in public health critical infrastructure, including broadband. Uh, and if, you know, hopefully by now we'll really to be out of this pandemic, but, but maybe without a vaccine, we might be heading into another, uh, you know, crisis situation. So I think a lot of it really depends on where we are. Uh, but at the same time, I think we have a, a lot of uh, know-how right here. Uh, and uh, I'll certainly... You know, I'm a, I don't know it all. Uh, and so, uh, but I also trust, and, and it would be a bipartisan uh, approach, to promise you that. So it would be bipartisan, it would be non-polarizing, and it would be uh, focusing on uh, the infrastructure and things, how we can move forward. All right, and our last question is from Ms. Harrison. Small businesses are awesome. But what about big employers, manufacturing plants, pipeline, fracking, etc.? Our biggest employer statewide is the Board of Education in almost every county. Infrastructure is wonderful, but how do we bring jobs to the state of West Virginia? How do we retain the citizens that don't want to leave, not just bringing people here? Yeah, so again, we're, we're hoping to capitalize on our uh, energy sector. Obviously, uh, that's that's been a big thing. So rare earth elements, uh, the oil and gas, uh, the uh, you know cracker type things. Those are all big. Uh, lots of employees, lots of high-paying jobs, and uh, those are things that I would uh, 
I would work on. I mean, we, we need game changers. Uh, at the same time, we can't, uh, you know, you have to look at those from a, from a geographic issue. Obviously, uh, oil and gas it would be more toward north central West Virginia. The eastern panhandle is totally different. They don't want necessarily to have a bunch of industry down there. The coal fields are, are ripe for any type of, uh, you know, post-mine land use. There's these great big areas that if you locate a business uh, on that area, if we invested in infrastructure to make them shovel ready, then, uh, you know, they could, you could attract all type of large uh, manufacturing uh, jobs into, into coal country. So, yes, I mean, I, I, I'd like the idea of entrepreneurialism and small business, but I love the idea of uh, big game-changing uh, manufacturing as well. And let's do, please, bring back our manufacturing of critical resources, such as uh, personal protective equipment. And I had a resolution this year toward the end of the session that called on uh, our pharmaceutical manufacturing to be done in America, and specifically done in West Virginia. You know, we have Mylan Pharmaceuticals up in Morgan County that employs 3,000 people. Well, let's let's do three or four of those uh heavy manufacturing uh, in West Virginia and bring back our uh, pharmaceutical manufacturing from uh, India and uh, China. So my last question, and this is not from comment section, this is from my end. Are there any poss or is there any possibility that there might be a presidential run in the future? <laughs> Thank you for asking. You know, though, I love Charleston, and I love Madison, which is about 35 minutes away from Charleston. Um, I'm going to leave the Washington, D.C. Uh, area to someone besides me. I, I've been involved in big campaigns. I always thought somebody like uh, uh, back in, I think it was 96, that, that I was hoping uh, Senator, then Senator Jay Rockefeller was going to run for president or be the vice president. I think uh, Senator Joe Manchin has uh, a lot of broad appeal as a centrist. Uh, but uh, this old bow-legged country doctor would stay put in Charleston or in Madison, West Virginia. So there goes my second chance of possibly becoming a vice president. <laughs> well, maybe we'll put you in, uh, you know, let you... Be an advisor for Central West Virginia in the governor's office. You seem to be uh, very sharp and caring. Thank person. you, thank you. That I would love to. I would absolutely love to. But uh, is there anything else you would like to add, sir? Well, I think knowledge and experience is going to be very important in the next four to eight years. We're at a crisis point in West Virginia. Uh, I think that I am uniquely qualified, frankly, uh, to be the next governor of the great state of West Virginia, to lead a bipartisan effort to transform West Virginia into the West Virginia that we, uh, we, we know it can be and should be with our geographic location, our great natural beauty, and great natural resources. Uh, if possible, I'd like to give a couple shout-outs to some of my friends in, in the Buckhannon area, Dr. Joe Reed, Dr. John Mathias. Dr. Frank Hartman and his son, Frank, Pastor Helen Oaks, Tyler and Sarah Broadwater, John and Nanette Rieger. Those are all folks that I know from that area, and they're, they're great people. I love your area. I love that area because you just go a little east, and you're in the wonderful mountains, Seneca Rocks and all that stuff, and you're not far from Morgantown. You're not far from Charleston. you got a great place there. It is. It's, it is beautiful. It is a beautiful area. And just West Virginia itself is just such a beautiful state. Well, and you have West Virginia Wesleyan. It's one of the most respected schools in the whole state of West Virginia. Thank you. I'm actually a, a student there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, that's, a, that's a great institution. I know a lot of uh, alumni. One of the best athletes that ever came out of there is a friend of mine, Boyd Dotson. He's a great athlete there back in the day. Well, thank you uh, so much, sir, 
uh, for coming on to the show. Uh, I do want to make just a couple of announcements. First off, again, the winner was Allison Harrison. I will be dropping off your prizes here shortly. On Thursday, I am going to have the privilege of interviewing Miss Kathy Kunkel. So she is going to be coming. She's also part of the uh, West Virginia Can't Wait uh, team. Uh, Again, on April 25th, be looking out at noon because you will have a live concert right in your living room from some of your favorite bands. So with that, it marks the end of our live broadcast. I want to thank everyone for tuning in and during these rough times to take care of each other. And thank you so much to our guest as well for taking his time to speak with us today. For that is the only way... I would like to say I appreciate your vote. I would appreciate your vote for governor. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And again, take care of each other during these rough times. Announcer, take us out. Thanks for tuning into the Pros and Cons Podcasts. Check back daily for more episodes. And remember, if everyone around you is an asshole, maybe you're the asshole.